Okay, so, long story short, I did not intend to detour this video series into a debunking of the Big Bang Theory. But I found it necessary, and surprisingly easy, to sink this, the main creation story the present world believes in, in lieu of God's creation story in Genesis. Praise the God of Abraham. I asked him for the wisdom of Solomon, because we sorely need it down here, and by gum he gave it to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. Visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So I want to begin by reviewing a little bit what I said last time in terms of this overview lecture, and then we'll finish the overview lecture. The, uh, we started by talking about the standard Big Bang, by which I mean the Big Bang without thinking about inflation. Uh, and I pointed out that it really describes only the aftermath of a bang. Uh, it begins with the, a description of the universe as a hot, dense soup of particles, uh, which more or less uniformly fills the entire available space, and the entire system is already expanding. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God is not a man that he should lie. Uh, cosmic inflation is a prequel to the conventional Big Bang story. Uh, it describes how repulsive gravity, uh, which in the context of general relativity can happen as a consequence of negative pressure. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and I keep his saying. Uh, as this happened, the total energy uh, of this patch would be very small and could even be identically zero. And the way that's possible uh, is caused by the fact that the gravitational field that fills the space uh, has a negative contribution to the energy. And as far as we could tell in our real universe, they're about equal to each other. They could cancel each other exactly as far as we can tell. It is the zero point energy that remains between negative one and positive one, negative two and positive two, right? It's the womb of the dragon. It's the womb of creation. A strange sort of nothing is destroying everything. Yes. Yeah. We night hubs live in the south, and it's there too. Uh, so the total energy could, in fact, be uh, exactly zero, which is what allows one to build a huge universe starting from either nothing or almost nothing which is the no thing that permeates all that is. So, it's, it's not just in our part of Fantasia. Maybe, yeah. it's already everywhere. Mm -hmm. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Yeah. Let's gather, please. Take your seats. Anybody not here? Double check that your cell phones are off, please. That would be very nice. Uh, I've been dreading saying these words, but welcome to the final episode of the Big Bang Theory. We're shooting Friday, Monday, Tuesday. The idea is planned all day Friday, all, all day Monday. The Big Bang is a contemporary creation story. Energy turns into matter. Energy into matter, he says. Um, which turns back into energy. There's no precise plan for creation worked out in advance. So the theory goes in the Big Bang that, well, actually, it's, we're not quite sure what they, they're, they're kind of undecided in several descriptions of the Big Bang. Either uh, the Big Bang started with a huge explosion of energy, and some it says is a big explosion of really hot matter. So which one is it? Did it explode with matter, or did it explode with energy? And then it turned into matter. The Big Bang Theory states that the universe began as a hot and infinitely dense point. Only a few millimeters wide, it was similar to a supercharged black hole. About 13.7 billion years ago, this tiny singularity violently exploded. And it is from this explosion this bang, that all matter, energy, space, and time were created. 
What happened next were two major stages of the universe's evolution. Called the radiation and matter eras, they're defined by key events that helped shape the universe. This, of course, implies that at least some of the radiation turned into matter. First came the radiation era, named for the dominance of radiation right after the Big Bang. This era is made of smaller stages, called epochs, that occurred within the universe's first tens of thousands of years. The earliest is the Planck epoch. No matter existed in the universe at this time. Now they're really implying the energy turned into matter. Or else, where did it come from? Only energy and the ancestor to the four forces of nature, the superforce. Also, if there was no matter at the time, how could it be hot and infinitely dense? Density requires matter. Density is compactness of matter. Am I right? Or am I right? And so does heat, since heat is simply particles bouncing around quickly. How do you have heat without matter? Um, one experiment we could do is see, does energy ever turn into matter? I mean, E equals MC squared, right? We know matter turns into energy. We can do fission bombs that destroys matter. Energy is created and other things like, f like fusion of the sun. But does the opposite occur? Does energy turn into matter? Is that a, is that a common thing? Because according to the Big Bang Theory, all, well, some, according to some accounts of the Big Bang Theory, that is what happened. All matter is from this single point of energy. Take a look. Physicists are about to attempt the impossible, turning light into matter. So it doesn't actually naturally occur. Theoretically, it should be possible to turn light into matter, as per E equals mc squared. In practice, well, easier said than done is an understatement. Now, 84 years after the process was theorized, some researchers reckon they're going to be able to do it, and they're about to start the experiment. <laughs> it's called the Bright-Wheeler process, and it has all to do with e equals mc squared. In their paper, Bright and Wheeler proposed that if you smash two photons, particles of light, together, the collision would result in a positron and an electron. Uh, you would have created matter out of light. Of course, they shoot, I mean, light hit, light is fired at each other all the time. It's called light. I mean, two flashlights shining at each other. Does matter get created ever that, at that time? It's not an easy thing to do. In fact, Bright and Wheeler thought it would be impossible noting that it would be hopeless to try to observe the pair, the pair formation in laboratory experiments. Recent scientists have been a bit more optimistic, but experimental setups required the addition of high massive energy particles, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and get this. It's still never been observed in a laboratory or out of one for that matter. They have never observed energy turning into matter. They've never observed light turning into matter Never been observed in a laboratory or out of one. Never happened. <laughs> the universe's new ability to form elements, the building blocks of matter, cued the matter era. But that's how the universe began. Energy turned into matter. All, all matter today was energy at some point. Have we ever seen that ever happen in human history? No. energy turns into matter which turns back into energy there's no precise plan for creation worked out in advance rather by an intricate and unrepeatable combination of chance and necessity humanity has evolved from and along countless other forms of life over billions of years ultimately our evolutionary history is uplifting because it enables us to see that we are part of a wholeness, a oneness. What you call the Big Bang was the phenomenal rupturing of the perfect symmetry of the source and the beginning of the imperfect asymmetrical separation of the holos, the illusory world of matter. The holos is everything around you. It's what you call physical reality. The holos is a mathematical projection from a cosmic mind, a dimensionless singularity of source. The physicist Max Planck said, 
All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. The mind is the matrix of all matter. This cosmic mind isn't some bearded creator god in the sky watching over everything. It's what you and I and all of us are when taken together. This oneness is grounded in scientific fact. We are made of the same stuff as all of creation. Everything that is, was, or will be started off together as one infinitesimal point, the cosmic seed. Life has since branched out, but this should not blind us to its underlying unity. These guys keep bringing up the Big Bang Theory, like it agrees with or confirms their religion somehow. Uh, have scientists actually verified that this religion is true to reality? Actually, no. These scientists are sorcerers, and they tailored the Big Bang Theory to fit their religion. Let's take a look. Uh, who came up with the Big Bang Theory? It was this guy, uh, George Lemaitre, although he is French, so it's probably pronounced something like Georges Lemaitre or something like that. Georges Lemaitre. Okay, his achievements. Lemaitre also proposed what is now called the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe which he called his hypothesis of a primeval atom, or the cosmic egg. In Lemaitre's theory, there was no bang, and at no time did Lemaitre describe the theory in terms of a physical explosion. The creation of the universe according to metaphysical beliefs... Metaphysical? Metaphysical? What does metaphysical mean? Metaphysics is like spiritual beliefs. Okay, so this guy... They're talking about spiritual beliefs translating them into science, trying to shoehorn their spiritual beliefs into science. The creation of the universe, according to metaphysical beliefs, unfolded in a spiral motion, like a spider's web, with sections in the web devoted to software, the functions of the universe. The whole dark matter, light matter, central portion of the cosmic egg, is like a vast storage place for the functional aspects of the shell like software cubby holes for the systems of the universe. Creation unfolded gradually, and as the software was ready, the initial hardware could be implemented. The source must generate the holos. It's part of the mathematical architecture of the system, an inevitable consequence of its mathematical structure. As the energy congealed to form the physical layer, Lamartier called this condensation. The physical layer. Lamatia called this the shell, referring to the cosmic egg. It had to be given its own copy of the software it needed to operate. Thus, from the center, the copies of the software it needed were distributed to the hardware on which it was needed. Lamatia, Lamatia described both this, but also described the formation of the intelligence hierarchy as a form of splitting of a central nucleus which contained all function. Thus, in Lamartia's early cosmology, the ultimate intelligence was gradually divided and divided functionally until smaller units were formed. Sound familiar? I am one, seeing myself divided. I am two and four and eight. I am the universe in diversity. And it was the smaller units that provided the functions to the Earth. But all this was dark matter, aka spirit. Lemaitre was extremely careful about his wording and very nervous about its impact. Why was he so nervous about his impact? Would, would it ever come to pass that people would realize that he was a sorcerer? He was actually trying to prove scientifically and mathematically that the metaphysical beliefs were correct, but trading a very fine tightrope in doing so. The met, wait, explaining that the metaphysical beliefs were correct. Of the Bible? This is not from the Bible. This is this is straight out of Taoism or Kabbalism. Or the Egyptianism is 
The ultimate intelligence was gradually divided and divided functionally until smaller and smaller units were formed. That's Hyperionism. That's not Christianity. What, uh, he was a Catholic priest, you say? Well, let's take a look. He was a Jesuit. The, cat, the Jesuit astronomer who conceived of the Big Bang. In 1927, a Prussian astronomer named Georges Lemartier looked at blah, blah, blah. So he was a Jesuit. And what are the Jesuits exactly? Ding, ding, ding. They're mystics, a companion to Jesuit mysticism. Jesuit mysticism. What is mysticism? Sorcery. Ding, ding, ding. Sorcerer. Hi, I'm Father Eric Sundrup, and I'm here with Father Patrick Gilger from America Media, and you are watching Jesuit Autocomplete. Jesuits believe. What do Jesuits believe? I believe that the Milwaukee Brewers are going to win gonna, the NL Central. No, this <laughs> got to have faith in something. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a very common joke. If you've met uh, one Jesuit, you've met one Jesuit. Or if, if you're in a room with five Jesuits, then there are 15 opinions in the room. Yeah, uh, most of them are mine. <laughs> now, we will start here with some quotes from another very high occultist, a Helena Blavatsky of the late 19th century. She writes in her Lucifer magazine from June 1888, titled Theosophy or Jesuitism. The Jesuits have practiced not only occultism, but black magic in its worst form, more than any other body of men, and to it they owe in large measure their power and influence, that is, to the black magic that they practice. Now, let's move on to another very famous, or should I say infamous, Jesuit sinner. This man goes by the name of Anthanasius Kircher. This man wrote dozens of books on various topics and subjects, but the book that we're going to focus upon is one in which he outlines a whole section of Kabbalah. Now, it's from this man that we get the whole idea of quote-unquote Christian Kabbalah. <laughs> what another joke. There's no such thing. This is witchcraft. This is divination. This is an abomination to the Lord. Here are pages from that very text that I have copied and put up here for you to look at. Of course, it's all written in Latin, but if you were to go online, you can read the translations of these wicked works that come from the book titled Oedipus Aegyptacaeus. All right, and this specific section on the Kabbalah is in Tome 2 and also Tome 2b, okay, pages 209 to 399. Okay, that's over 190 pages that he published in 1653 on the Kabbalah. And as you can see, these two pictures are on the left, you have his tree of life, and on the right, you see this flower-looking picture with all these Jewish names, supposedly the 70-some-odd names, sacred names of God that can be found in the, hidden in the Bible. And of course, in the center of this picture is the Jesuit IHS. Do Catholics do yoga? I know a few. I'm just not flexible, so I, I don't. <laughs> Speaking of an embodied spirituality, this is definitely something that's very present. Now, I guess we shouldn't just like, you know, blow right past the question. And I think the concern comes from this, that these Hindu practices or these practices, yoga practices, arose within a particular context and were associated with a religion that is not our religion. It's a, tr it's a spiritual discipline that is not our spiritual discipline. But the question becomes, can those practices be infused with something other than their point of origin? Now, we want to be careful because it can be very easy to just kind of co-opt this other thing and take it to say, oh, now this belongs to us. We're mm. going to fill it with whatever we want. Now, we want to be gentle and careful about that. You've, you'll hear, hear frequently from Jesuits this, this point of finding God in all things. So that there's this sense of we do not need to be afraid of these other practices and we can look for what is good and what can be helpful with, within this tradition, what can we take from that? And I think that's a lot of finding God in all things. We don't have to be afraid of these other practices. I totally agree. If you've been around a Jesuit institution, you probably know the phrase, finding God in all things. It's an important part of our spirituality. 
seeing God in all things is not something that we do very naturally in our world and I it's something that I do through the Jesuits I see God in, in the city as much as in the country as in nature walk out the door and just be like this is all God too everything's God just deepening in my knowledge and love of God and finding God in all things, finding God in, in the land and creation, and especially finding God in the people that I meet and share life with, you know. God is not some separate being up there. She is right here, in the bark of a tree, in a friend's voice, in a stranger's eye. God is in us and all around us, so in some senses, when we're looking, trying to find God, we're like a little fish looking for the ocean. We're surrounded by God. We're immersed in God. That way, when you see the train drive by, you just be like, whoa, there's God in the form of a train. <laughs> the Pope did not help his cause, as it was clear he was well aware that at some point of what George was trying to do. Are we aware of what he's trying to do? Uh, in 1951, Pope Pius XII declared that, oh, there he is, declared that Lamartia's theory provided a scientific validation for the creation. No, completely different than the biblical creation story. Now, the reason that the, uh, the Pope here has these circles with the stars in is because when the, uh, the magician stands within the circle, he is protected from his own magic. Whereas the people outside of the circle who are watching and observing it are not protected, so they will feel the effects of the spell. Lamartia made desperate efforts to stop the Pope from expressing his unbounded enthusiasm for the discoveries, pointing out that the effect would be the exact opposite of what he was trying to do, prove scientifically what he metaphysically knew. Prove scientifically what he metaphysically knew. He knew it metaphysically that this is how the creation came about. How did he metaphysically know it? He didn't know it through the Bible because the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say what he said. It doesn't say there's a cosmic egg. He metaphysically knows it. How does he metaphysically know it? Because he's Illuminati. He's, he's an illuminated one who believes that he is God and that everything is God, including himself. So now we need to step back. The cosmic egg is a universal symbol known by every spiritual and mystic Jesuit mysticism and mystic person since time immemorial. The cosmic egg has a physical hardware shell and a non-physical software core. The software is now called dark matter by physicists. And you go, wait a second. Physicists believe in a cosmic egg theory that mystics do? Yes, because these physicists are all warlocks. Um, and is variously estimated to be about 96% of the entire universe. Where's the evidence for the 96% of the universe being dark matter that nobody can see? He, they metaphys these scientists metaphysically know it. They can't prove it scientifically, but they metaphysically know it. You know, they say, oh, there's all this dark matter. How do they know? They haven't observed the dark matter, but they theorize it exists because they're mystics. Um, at the center, the yoke is the ultimate intelligence, God. Well, don't just stand there. God's a busy man. Lamartia was trying to combine the idea of the tree of life with the cosmic egg. One starts with the yoke of the egg, the ultimate intelligence, the source, I presume, containing all the functions that the physical will ever need. Then creation begins, gradually branching and branching into the tree of life, the intelligence hierarchy. No matter at this stage. Nothing physical at all, simply software. Pythagoras' student Plato knew the ultimate reality was not material at all, but was mental form, thought, mind. Nothing physical at all, simply software. That which animates. And as the tree of life grows, so does the cosmic egg. The universe expands, the universe seen from the rim appears to expand. Metaphysical belief says that atom and egg are identical and the contents are not physical. I repeat, not physical. It's like an object that contains all the software ever needed. Metaphysical belief says, they just say, like, oh, metaphysical belief, what is this metaphysical belief? It's the belief of the sorcerers. 
uh, Einstein, Kabbalist Jew. Einstein was both Jewish and a Kabbalist, and I believe recognized that in the expanding universe, Lamartia had managed to marry science with metaphysics and mysticism, merging many mystical ideas at the same time. The word God is for me nothing but the expression and product of human weakness. The Bible, a collection of venerable, but still rather primitive legends. No interpretation, no matter how subtle, can, for me, change anything about this. Albert Einstein, the God letter. For Einstein, he did not believe that an anthropomorphic God was the reason you needed to lead this moral life. But essentially, for Einstein, morality was a human construct. That actually goes back to Bruce Spinoza. For Spinoza, God was the universe. God was everything. When Einstein used the word God, and he did quite often, he used it metaphorically, very much in the same sense that Spinoza used the word God. It was abstract. God was creation. God was the laws of the universe. It was not a personal God. His Kabbalistic upbringing would have given him the symbolism of the egg. In whatever way the egg is represented symbolically, it is forced to look static, whether you use a Fabergé egg, Chinese ivory balls, or Celtic trees of life, the appearance is static, and Einstein originally had some difficulty in accepting the notion of an egg that was blowing up like a balloon. But once it was explained that the expansion involved many of the visible phenomena seen in astronomy, he rejoiced and said the equivalent of, I'm with you all the way, let's go for it. And there they are, Lamartier and Einstein going, let's foist this upon the world through the, through the publishing industry controlled by my brethren. Reichwitz Protocol number five. The other great power is the press. By repeating without cessation certain ideas, the press succeeds in the end in having them accepted as actualities. Lamartia met Einstein several times and they became friends. According to legend, the two traveled together to the U.S. state of California for a series of seminars and after the Belgian detailed his theory, Einstein stood up and applauded. Okay, there you go. So, these theories stem from occultism, not necessarily entirely from science and empirical observation. The Big Bang Theory is actually a secular version of their religion. I suspect that the scientific evidence for it is actually just stuff they made up and printed in the media that they control. Protocol number two. Two. We have persuaded them to accept as the dictates of science theory. Okay, so they're the they persuaded... <laughs> It is with this object in view that we are constantly, by the means of our press, arousing a blind confidence in these theories. <clears throat> Big Bang Theory. So, what's new in the world of physics? Nothing. <laughs> really? Nothing? Well, with the exception of string theory, not much has happened since the 1930s. And you can't prove string theory. At best, you can say, hey, look, my idea has an internal logical consistency. <laughs> the intellectuals of the Goyim will puff themselves up with their knowledge and without any logical verification of them will put into effect all the information available from science which our agent tour specialists have cunningly pieced together for the purpose of educating their minds in the direction we want. So, is there any logical verification of the Big Bang Theory? That the universe and everything in it exploded and multiplied itself from a single infinitesimal point? It is still just a theory, after all. And it's basically the same as their religion. In fact, I suspect it's derived from their religion. Let me give you some evidence to that effect. How old do they say the universe is? 13.8 billion years old or 13.7, according to some sources. There's that magic 137 number, code for Kabbalah. Remember what the Kabbalists say, that one or more less than a number counts as the number just the same. Uh, so 138 is the same as 137. This number appears elsewhere in scientific theories. There's a number that holds some of the deepest secrets in the universe. 
It's responsible for how chemical reactions happen, how stars burn, and is so key to our existence that if it were off by just a few percentage points, you, me, all of this might not even be here. And somehow, it comes out to 1 over 137. It's a number that's baffled scientists for nearly a century. And according to physicist Richard Feynman, is one of the biggest damn mysteries in physics. 1 over 137, otherwise known as the fine structure constant, or alpha, is a fundamental constant of nature. Is it that the universe turns on this number, or that these scientists are just making up theories and sticking the number 137 in it? Look, there's even the 4 and the 7 there, just like clockwork. Reichland's protocol number 14. But above all, let us monopolize education. By this means, we spread ideas that are useful to us and shape the children's brains as suits us. I mean, if it's taught in every school around the world, parroted by every press agency, and trumpeted by every scientist on their payroll, it must be true, right? And it's trumpeted so much that, that even the capitalists themselves start to believe it. If the Big Bang is our new creation story, the story that explains how the universe began, then who is God? God is a name we give to the oneness of it all. Now, am I saying all these theories are false? No, it's possible 137 is a recurring number in science, just like with the fine structure constant and that God has arranged it that way. But the age of the earth isn't 13.7 billion years ago. The Hebrew year is 5781. And that's more or less how old the Earth is, believe it or not. All the science that supports anything else would appear to be a hoax. Let me give you a taste of what I mean. 